Yaron and I were talking uh, before the sessions, and we're talking about each of our talks and what we're planning to cover, and there was a lot of overlap, there was a lot of points that we were going to touch on that were similar. We weren't going to say exactly the same or highlight exactly the same thing about the point, but we thought, so we were talking and we thought, well, you know, maybe what we should do is do them as two panels, sessions, two discussions where we're highlighting certain points um, from the Romantic Manifesto. I was planning to highlight some of the more philosophical points. Iran's talking about the exploration of art in your personal life. Um, but we'll try to weave that together into these um, talks. And then we thought it would just be more interesting uh, to have a discussion about some of these points and to look at some points from different angles. And we don't always agree about everything, and even, even about our, certainly about our valuations of, and responses to different uh, artworks, though there's overlap, I think, as well. In our yeah, reaction. and that the fact that we disagree and the fact that our valuation is often different, I think, is important to some of the points we're going to be making in terms of how you should go about exploring arts and, and, uh, and experiencing arts and, and not feel like you have to follow some kind of dogma and some kind of set experience that all objectivists, all objectivists respond to art in the same way. So we wanted to illustrate that not all objectivists respond to art in the same way. And it's important. That's, that is an important idea because I think it, it, it inhibits some people's ability to experience and enjoy art when they are modeling themselves versus what Ayn Rand thinks or what somebody else thinks and what they should feel right. and what they should experience versus what they actually are experiencing, which is, which is really the key to art. It's what you experience. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into all of that. Um, so we were going to start with the point that, so we were both, I mean, part of what we were talking about before <laughs> the session is we both obviously reread the Romantic Manifesto in preparation for our talks and deciding what we were going to highlight. And both of us, I mean, had the experience of like it, that the book again blew us away with how interesting um, and rich the book is, how many insights, there's multiple insights on almost every page. Um, and so, Yaron, you wanted to talk a little bit about just... Sure, the, I, I'm the, curious, and don't be shy, right? Because I know maybe this is an intimidating question. I'm curious how many people have not read uh, The Romantic Manifesto, because it, it's helpful for us in terms of just calibrating uh, how we do it. Okay, so the vast majority, well, okay, yeah, keep, yeah. keep the hands up because I want to <laughs> get a, oh wait. Okay, so maybe 15% maybe or, or something like that have not. So let me start by encouraging you to read this amazing book. It, 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 you know, I've read it, I don't know, four or five times in my life, and I read it again in preparation for this conference, and getting blown away is an understatement, particularly this time that I read it. Um, the more I know about art, the more I've experienced art, and those of you who know me know that I seek art out and I spend a lot of time with art, the more I know about it, the more impressed I am with the depth of, of what she is conveying in, in the Romantic Manifesto, how original it is, how new it is, and how insightful it is. And it's not just, in a sense, it's not a, it's not just that it's about the art out there, it's about your response to the art. So it's amazingly psychological. And, and Rand generally, if you read Rand, her essays are almost always psychological. There's always a psychological aspect, when she's, even when she's talking about deep philosophy. But here, it's because it's about your response to art, it's amazingly psychological. And I think we can all learn from reading the essay, not just about art, but about ourselves, about our own psychology. And, but I want to say something about her genius, because <laughs> Rand is a unique genius. She's a philosopher, and we're all familiar with her as a philosopher. She's a great artist, and we're all familiar with her as a great artist. And what you see in the Romantic Manifesto is those, I mean, you see it in the literature, obviously, but here in the Romantic Manifesto, what you see is both of those coming together. Her deep understanding of the creative process, a personal understanding of the creative process, a kind of understanding of the creative process that it's hard for me when I'm reading it to get because I've never created art. So it's something that only the creators, I think, fully understand. So combine that with a vast knowledge of the history of art 
And a woman who went out and sought art and experienced art and engaged with art, all kinds of art, over her lifetime. So the experiential, the creation, and overlay that with a genius as a philosopher. And that's what you get in the Romantic Manifesto. It's the combination of all of that. And, and it makes it so that, again, the more I read the book, the less I understand it in some sense. The more I get how much I don't know, the more I get how deep she is and how, in a sense, it's hard to understand without the inductive knowledge that she had about art and about that experience of creating art. So don't be, I mean, my intention here is not to intimidate you into not reading it. Read it because every reading you'll get something out of it. Uh, but it, 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 it's, it's truly a profound book in many respects. It, it, it's, it's the one that I find the hardest to fully grasp, to fully concretize for myself. Uh, yeah, I have exactly that same experience. Um, and it's important, I think, really to emphasize that I'm certainly from my perspective, but you're from Iran's too, as he just said, that I approach the book from, I'm a consumer of art, not a producer of art. And if you think of the genesis of the book, it's, I mean, the subtitle is, it's a philosophy of literature. And the book comes out of lectures that she gave on the art of fiction that's now collected into a book that Tor Buckman edited. But that is aimed, I think that those set of lectures were aimed primarily, not exclusively, but primarily at aspiring fiction writers. So they're from the point of view of the producer of art. And I think there's a lot of remnants of that in the Romantic Manifesto, that it's distinctively has a perspective that this is what it is like from the point of view of the creator of art. And that, that is a layer of complexity that often goes over my head. Um, <clears throat> the, and I, I want to now make a comment about um, some of the themes that she brings up in the introduction to the work that help place this whole issue of romanticism and aesthetics into the context of what I think she was doing as a philosopher and what she was particularly interested in. Um, Ayn Rand was a champion of the 19th century. I mean, she called the 19th century the greatest century in Western history and the greatest century existentially. So it's the century in which you have just tremendous advancements, tremendous advancements in standard of living, of rising populations, of the creation of the middle class. Um, you get tremendous um, developments in science, in technology, um, and in art. So she thinks in terms of the culture, the 19th century is the greatest century in Western history. It's the greatest existentially, but not intellectually. It, she says it's one of the worst intellectually or phil philosophically. And part of what is happening in the philosophical world is they're turning against all these great values that the 19th century is helping bring into existence. And you can boil those three sort of to get the, the underpinning of what the, the, the cultural trend of the 19th century is, and this is the way she puts it in the introduction, of individualism, capitalism, and romanticism. These are the three fundamental values that the 19th century brings into existence and gives expression to. And individualism here means individualism in ethics. So you can think of it in terms of the declaration, the pursuit of your own happiness. That morally is what is, is ascendant in terms of culture, not again in terms of the philosophy of the 19th century, but the culture. It's, it's takes seriously in the ethical realm that the individual is the primary unit. And then the consequence of that, if the declaration is taken seriously, the consequence socially, economically, is capitalism. <clears throat> and this perspective on the individual and the individual taking himself seriously, concerned with his self-expression, self-development, the, what the movement you get in art is romanticism. Romanticism, one of the things she highlights about it is it's about the individual self-expression. And so, in a way, you can think of it, it, there's an individualism that's underlying all the, capitalism is the system of individualism, romanticism is the art of the individual, and that glorifies the individual, 
And individualism in morality is about taking seriously your own life and happiness. And these are the values that she is interested in, that she champions, and that in the 20th century she has to defend and put on a secure philosophical foundation because her view is all three have crumbled or disintegrated. That individualism has been replaced by all forms of collectivism in morality, that capitalism is being replaced with socialism in, in America with a mixed economy, and that romanticism has disintegrated. And they all for a similar reason, that they did not have a philosophical, un, there was no philosophical understanding of the essence of any, of any of individualism and morality, of capitalism or romanticism. And she's going to write that this is what they are, and this is how to understand and defend them. And if you think of her major philosophical work, Virtue of Selfishness, it's a new concept of egoism is, is its subtitle. This is about understanding at the deepest roots individualism in morality and the pursuit of happiness. And then capitalism on the unknown ideal is about defending capitalism. And the Romantic Manifesto is about defending romanticism. And that's a way of understanding her work. And then ITOE, Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, is a defense of reason that she thinks underlies all of these. And that's in essence, I think, what she's interested in from a philosophical sort of a non-fiction writing perspective. And some of her motivation is, and, and she mentions this, right, she, she glimpsed the 19th century. She, had, she was born in 1905. So she, uh, and, and in my view, the 19th century culturally ends with World War I. And, and uh, I think historians agree on this. It, it, World War I was a, a, a profoundly traumatic event in Western civilization. It, it, it ends the, the, the sense of life, the culture of the 19th century in, in bloodshed, in disaster, in, in, in a horrible, horrible demo. Maybe, maybe the most horrible war ever. Because it's so um, pointless. Yeah, yeah, and it was pointless. What was it about? It wasn't an ideological struggle. It wasn't good versus evil. I mean, you, you know, you, you guys can tell me afterwards what World War I was about and why, why we entered. It, it, it was completely pointless. And so it is, it's, it's this horrific war, but what, what was going on before is the consequence of this individualism, capitalism, and romanticism is a culture that embraces life a culture that is vibrant and exciting and optimistic and positive and individualistic in the sense that people are pursuing their happiness. And to some extent, we can't even know what that culture was. And, and she says that, I can't remember exactly where, but she says, if you didn't experience it, you can't know what it was because we're surrounded by a particular culture today. It just is what it is. And, and we can change ourselves, but it's hard to change. The culture is not changing. Right? It is what it is. So we don't know what it's like to live in a world where everybody, in the culture, in the air, in the, in the vibe, you know, <laughs> is pursuing happiness, is pursuing their own achievement, is pursuing their own life, is, is excited about life. That that is the cultural trend, the, 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 the consensus. And she glimpsed that. She saw that in her youth, before, before the Russian Revolution. She saw it, and she identified it later in the kind of artwork that was created there, in the Romanticism, and she identifies it explicitly. And I think that, again, colors a lot of how she writes about this. She knows what is possible, and that's the world she wants, that and better, right? That and better. And again, it's a context that's very hard to recreate for ourselves. It's a very hard to completely understand. I kind of get a sense of what she's talking about. But to completely understand what that is, what that kind of culture would be, I wish, right? I wish we could experience it. I wish we will, some of you will experience it one day. But that is, that is what she is bringing to the writing of the Romantic Manifesto, and really to all of her writing, is the knowledge of what is possible culturally, not just individually, but culturally. And, and that is... That is, uh, I, I think, really important to, to, to understanding why she views romanticism as so important. Um, yeah, it, it comes up in the intro, this, this yeah, point same. again. And one of the things, one of the points she makes is that what she glimpsed was an, a cultural and artistic atmosphere in which uh, Hugo and Schiller, the, <laughs> so two writers, were part of the contemporary aesthetic scene. They're not relics of the past. They were part of the contemporary scene, 
one anecdote that I hold that like, to me is unfathomable. It's a way of holding that you can't grasp what the 19th century must have been like. So both, we'll probably talk about this at some point, both Iran and I like Beethoven quite a bit. In, I think this is, it's December 1808, Beethoven premieres in one concert his fifth symphony, his sixth symphony, his fourth piano concerto, <laughs> his choral fantasy, and some other works in a four-hour concert. I mean, these are major masterworks that you'll be lucky if the whole 21st century has worked four works comparable to that. And it's one concert that doesn't do too well because people are exhausted and it's new music, <laughs> they don't quite understand it. And that, I mean, that, like, what such a culture and atmosphere must have been like, it, you, it's, you, it's important, it's really important, I think, to hold. You can't really grasp what that was like. But yet, that, it's just like capitalism, the unknown ideal. You have to hold it. This is an, un, an ideal, but there's an element of it that is unknown and that you're trying to reach. Well, just one thing about the concert, because it's interesting, because it's a link to capitalism and art and capitalism. Mm -hmm. Beethoven, to a large extent, is the first artist, certainly the first, I think, musician, to actually make a living independently. He is not dependent just on aristocrats paying him or the church paying him, but he puts on concerts and sells tickets and makes money from the sale of the tickets. For the first time, you've got a middle class, the so people are playing pianos at home. So the first time people are buying sheet music. So Beethoven and then, of course, musicians following are selling sheet music. Mm -hmm. And they're making, they're making royalties off of the music that they make. So they, they're actually making money. And this, again, integration of capitalism with aesthetics, which nobody talks about and nobody thinks of, is happening during the beginning of the 19th century and then is taken for granted later on. But it was revolutionary. Mozart and Bach and Handel have to grovel before kings and aristocrats and, and popes and cardinals and whatever in order to get crumbs so that they can write their music. Finally, there's a middle class, there's freedom, in other words, to actually, there's capitalism, so that these musicians can actually be independent creators and actually sell their art to an audience that is willing to buy it and engage with it. So the, 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 the 19th century, in so many ways, is the most important century in all of human history. It's the manifestation of what is possible to mankind. And the great tragedy, of course, is that is happening at the same time as intellectually, philosophically, everything is falling to pieces. And that's why the 20th century, that's why World War I, in a sense, actually happens. If you understand uh, Rand's theory of history, ideas ultimately manifest themselves in the reality, and World War I is a manifestation of those bad ideas that are being developed during the 19th century. There's a lag. So maybe let's turn to um, what Rand, why Rand views art as so important. What is it about art that is so, I mean, as she puts it, crucial to human survival, certainly crucial to human happiness. And what Rand identifies, and, and again, this is, this is really genius, is the fact that we are conceptual beings. The fact that ideas are held at such an abstract level makes it very difficult to sustain those ideas, to hold those ideas, to, to, and to constantly live with those ideas, apply those ideas in our day-to-day -day life every, every day, all the time, as principles. Right? Because they're abstract, and, and you know, we, need, we need a concretization of them. We need something where we can see and say, yes, that's what it is. That's what it means. That's what life's about. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's why I'm exercising my life the way I'm exercising it. And this is true of the most deepest ideas that we hold. That is, our metaphysical ideas, our fundamental views about life and about the world and about existence and about our own lives and our place in the world in which we live. And this is hard, particularly on a day-to-day -day basis where the world is not necessarily cooperating with your ambitions and your, you know, your needs or your, your ambitions. And art gives us a concrete, an actual reality for those 
metaphysical ideas about what the world is like. Instead of just holding an abstraction, we can now imagine something, a, a hero in a novel, a certain character in a novel, a painting, or even a piece of music, although it's a lot more complex to see the link. Um, I think Ayn Rand in her writings has a lot of um, really, I think partly because she's an artist, so she has a lot of examples that are really succinct, yet really powerful. And I, if I had to pick the best example that she has, it's from the Romantic Manifesto, and it's from the start of the essay, Art and Sense of Life, to illustrate, she's trying to capture in sort of, if you, if you think about what the example is, in emotional terms, the, this, this power, this metaphysical power of art. So she gives the example of, if you saw a painting of a beautiful woman, what your reaction would be. And then it's a beautiful woman with a coal sore. <clears throat> and that you would have a powerful reaction. It says something very, very different about life if that's what the artist decided to depict and this is what he thought of as this is important, this is what you need to focus on in life, this is what you have to keep in mind at all times, that values are so easily undercut by a reality that is, in a, in a sense, hostile to you and so easily will thwart any of your ambitions and any of your choices. And just in that one simple example, you get, yeah, art has something really powerful and really philosophical to say. And so what she's emphasizing and the, the crux of the objectivist uh, theory of aesthetics, of its power, is that it's philosophical, that it has something to say about the nature of reality, that as you navigate life, this is what you should pay attention to. This is what's important. This is what you have to keep in mind at all times. Um, so it, it, it's essentially about that art has a metaphysical meaning, though she emphasizes, and this is particularly from the point of view of literature, and the subtitle of the book is it's a philosophy of literature. So she's um, sort of in the second half of the book particularly concerned with her own art form, uh, literature, and even more so the novel. And she, I think just she, say yeah. a little bit about the example you used, because I think we can, we can break it down a little okay. bit for those maybe who haven't read the book. What does it say if a painter paints a painting of a beautiful woman, it's focused, it's just imagine in your head, this beautiful woman coming out, she's dressed beautifully, she's elegant. He's saying something about life. He's saying something about the beauty of life, the vibrancy of life, that, that, that beauty is possible, that beauty is important, right? And that, and that, and that life is, that the world is knowable, it's sharp, it's in focus, you can see it. In, in, she talks about style as reflecting an art of psychopistemology. That is the way he sees the world in a deep sense. Uh, the way he uses his, his, his reason, his senses. And he's saying the world is knowable and there's beauty in the world. And then imagine that same beautiful woman with that cold soul. And now what is the artist saying? He's saying, yeah, there's beauty in the world, but it's got a defect. And it's always going to have a defect. And there's something important about the defect. Because he put it in the painting. He could have chosen not to. He could have painted over it. Even if the model had, a, had had a cold sore that morning, he could, have, he could have painted over it, but he chose to use it. Now, in real life, we have cold sores all the time. But art is not there to reflect to us real life. Art is there to reflect what should and could be, to quote Aristotle, I guess. Right? And so the metaphysical importance is the cold sore is a, a reflection of the artist telling us Yes, beauty is possible, but it will always be undercut. The undercutting is what's important. And now the philosophical meaning of the painting completely changed, and what's important is your emotional response to the painting, hopefully, depending on what your philosophy is and your sense of life is, will completely change. And just a little bit like that, just something little like that can change your entire response to it because it's so deep, and that's why the, the example is so wonderful because it encompasses so much about art and about your response and how you respond to art. But it's that, those metaphysical, when we talk about metaphysical judgments, we're talking about those kind of things. Is, is life knowable? Do I belong on this planet? Can I know the world? What is my relationship to existence, to reality out there? Those are the kind of answers 
that art reflects back at us. That's what it concretizes, the answers to those kind of questions. Um, yeah, that, that's important to really emphasize that. Um, and then, the, so the, the essence that she thinks of it is it, it, it projects something metaphysical, but she also writes, particularly again about literature, that the only way to convey the full reality and the full meaning of moral principles and moral values and different moral viewpoints is to project their full meaning and significance in a person's life um, and in life. And like if you were to live this morality or these moral values, these moral principles, this is what it would look like. This is what that kind of life in the world would look like. And she makes a point about that people with the fountainhead would ask themselves often in, when they're in difficult situations trying to navigate more, like what should I or should I not choose? What would Rourke do? And that helps them orient them to where the answer lies, that he's a concretized projection and embodiment of certain moral principles and moral values. And you need that concretization and objectification in reality, like a vision of a moral person who will then help you. And it's not an accident. So for instance, the religious people, what would Jesus do? That this is, it, it, but it's a projection of he's supposed to be the exemplar of their morality. And if they're taking that seriously, of thinking what would he do in this situation or that situation? And it gives full meaning and life to the, the, the moral principles that are involved and that are at stake. So what you get in the Romantic Manifesto from a philosophical perspective is an explanation of why aesthetics is a branch of philosophy. So it is true, in, if you look in the history of philosophy, that the major philosophers, and this particularly means the systematizers in philosophy, and the primary ones are Plato, Aristotle, and Kant, all write about aesthetics. <clears throat> and there's a reason, because they're systematizers and thinking about the meaning of the system, they have, I think, an, at least an implicit, if, and often more than an implicit, understanding that the full meaning of philosophy and of philosophical ideas can only be presented or requires art to be fully presented. So what philosophy does, uh, or actually let me back up. If you've read Philosophy Who Needs It, the lead essay of the book Philosophy Who Needs It, that is Ayn Rand's explanation, of, or in part, of the structure of philosophy and of the branches of philosophy. And if you remember that essay, or if you go and then read it, what you'll see is she has a lot to say about metaphysics what the questions of metaphysics are, do I have the power of choice or not? Am I able to understand the world or not? Is the world fully intelligible or not? A lot about trying to isolate. These are the questions of metaphysics. These are the issues. These are why those issues, like different answers to these questions matter. And she does the same for epistemology. Does knowledge begin with the senses? Does it have to crucially rely on some revelation? <clears throat> what is certainty possible and what is its nature? She goes through some of the questions of what epistemology is and again of why the answers, why there's different answers and why these different answers matter. Then she does the same for ethics. And then she indicates for politics, but I think she's taking for granted that people understand, yeah, political issues divide people, there's different answers and it's significant what your view of what government should do and so on. She sort of takes that for granted. And then she says there's a fifth branch and it's aesthetics. And it deals with the needs and refueling of a human consciousness. But there's no discussion of what its questions are, of why those questions matter. So you don't really get an explanation of why aesthetics is the fifth branch of philosophy. And I think if you, if you read or reread Philosophy Who Needs It, you'll see you, she couldn't give an explanation in that essay because she's introducing the subject and she's trying to get, she's talking to the cadets at West Point, and she's trying to get them interested in philosophy and understand some of its structure. And it's only when you grasp that and really have a first-hand grasp of that, that there is such a thing as metaphysics and epistemology and ethics and they're interconnected, 
and which is a point she's making in the essay, and then politics falls out of that, and this is what the guidance that philosophy is meant to offer. It's guidance on these questions, answers to help you navigate the world. And then what aesthetics as a branch of philosophy and sort of what philosophy identifies and what she identifies, I think, fully in the Romantic Manifesto is philosophy is incomplete. Philosophy itself can't provide the full guidance that it's promising. So the whole, and she called, I mean, it's a philosophy for living on earth. It's meant to offer guidance. It is developing all these principles that are supposed to guide you but these principles, these philosophical principles by themselves are insufficient. And the only science that's going to identify that is philosophy itself. And so what aesthetics is about is identifying there's a philosophical need <clears throat> that a human consciousness has, given that we're philosophical beings. There's a philosophical need that philosophy itself can't satisfy. And then, so the basic question for aesthetics is, what satisfies this need? And her answer in the Romantic Manifesto is art satisfies this need. Art is what concretizes and objectifies and makes fully real to each individual the full nature of philosophical principles and their action guiding significance. And then it's, then it's an exploration of how art does this and how different forms of art do it in different ways. And so but that's the crux of the issue. And so you get for the first time, like I took, I mean, all through graduate school in, that I had in philosophy, that we dealt a little bit with aesthetics here and there. There was no explanation of why do philosophers deal with aesthetics. And what you get in the Romantic Manifesto is if you're really a philosopher in the sense that she is or Aristotle is or Plato is, you have to be interested in aesthetics because it's the means of making fully real what different philosophical principles mean. And it's significant that it's different. It's not, you don't need this just for objectivism. You need this for philosophy, period. And, you know, I think some of the most successful philosophies have known this, and maybe the most successful is religion. Religion knows, particularly, particularly the Christians, they know they need art. It's not an accident that for centuries they hired the best artists they could and they made their churches beautiful and they commissioned the greatest artists in the world to paint Jesus over and over and over again right and there's a reason because they understood not explicitly I think but they understood implicitly the power that art provides and that art completes their ideological their philosophical mission their philosophical purpose that art is what will actually inspire their parishioners to do what they want to do, motivates them, fuels them, drives them. Uh, you know, if you think of some of the great music that was written before the Romantic period, it's mostly church music. If you, if you, if you, if you look at Bach or you look at uh, Handel, if you look at uh, other composers of that period, what they wrote was for the church to try to inspire in the parishioners. The emotion that the philosophy is trying to intellectually, if you could call it intellectually, motivate them towards and they understood this relationship between the emotion and the cognitive the emotion and motivation and art has always been used and then if you look at the authoritarians in the 20th century they understood this so the communists use art in order to inspire the proletarian not good art and that's why it doesn't really inspire the proletarian uh, but art in order to try and the, and if you look at nazi aesthetics the nazis were very conscious of the need to create an aesthetic experience to drive and to motivate and to, and to uh, the, 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 the collective. The beauty of romanticism is that it's about the individual. It's not about collective motivation. It's about motivation for the individual. It's our fuel for you as an individual. And I think, particularly for the new people, you know, this is why Ayn Rand thought that art was so crucial. Not just for philosophy, not just. Not, but for life, for all of us as individual, and I'll talk, we'll talk a lot more about this tomorrow, that art is not optional. It's not something nice to do on the side once in a while. Art is a crucial part of life. And to the extent that you don't experience it, you are poor spiritually for that. And it's, 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 it's crucial to immerse yourself and to, to, to find avenues to seek it out. And we'll, we'll, 
We'll discuss that quite a bit tomorrow and how to do it and where to do it and so on. But, but I want to make this point. This is not, and, and I know a lot of objectivists to feel this way. Ah, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, who has time for that? I'm busy, right? I mean, it's great, but it's, it really philosophically is something that you need, need in order to live a good life, in order to live the kind of life, an egoistic life. Again, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Um, and this, Iran's uh, emphasizing, or emphasized at the start, Ayn Rand's extensive experience with art and much broader than just her field literature. Um, I think this, it's, it's telling about her that she's interested in this because she's, and it combines with her interest in philosophy. But it's, I think it also explains, um, so a common point, and it's often viewed as a negative, but which I view as a positive, is that Ayn, I mean, it's, it's, people remark about Ayn Rand, and you can see it a little bit in, in question periods, for instance, of how violently emotional, both positive and negative, she can get about issues. When the questioner, the, the, really, you, you feel things about that? I'm just asking a kind of intellectual question. What do you think about blah, blah, blah? <laughs> and to her, it's not just an intellectual qu question. And of getting that why it activates such an emotional context on her part is it's the integration of her intellect with her values. That integration is facilitated by art. So if, to, to take one of the major kind of philosophical issues that comes up in the Romantic Manifesto, the issue of free will and determinism. If you hold this just as an intellectual issue, there were some thinkers in the history of the West who talked about free will and they had some theories about it and some are better than the others and some are more intellectual about it and some are more, it puts free will on the side of emotion and some are really mystical, it puts it on the side of the supernatural and religion and that's bad and then there are determinists, some are more scientific and some are more religious and that's what this issue is about. If, if you just hold it like that, it doesn't have emotional significance, or it doesn't have that much emotional significance. If you see, and both sides portrayed in art, and if you think of it as it's a battle between Hugo and Shakespeare, and you hold it like that, and you have a response, maybe not a sense of life, we'll talk about some of that, to Shakespeare, but that if you take like Romeo and Juliet, I have a love-hate relationship with that <laughs> play. I like it and I go to see it often and when it's performed well, it is very powerful. But it's perverse philosophically. It's, and you go out of the theater mad, but glad to have experienced it because it really conveys what determinism means and the way it thwarts the pursuit of values. And if you hold it like that and you hold Hugo as this is what it means to take free will seriously, and then you hear somebody talking about, yeah, well, I'm a scientist, and obviously there's no free will. What your value experience is, is you want a world of Shakespeare, not Hugo. And that's monstrous. And that's part of what it means to have philosophical ideas really embedded in your understanding and your perspective, and it has a real value perspective. And she has that in spades. And so she has, I think, emotional reactions to where, for other people like, how could you be having any kind of emotion about this? And she sees the whole meaning, and it's art that helps her, not only art, but art helps her to get the full meaning of different philosophical ideas. Yeah, because art concretizes those philosophical ideas. So when you see a concretization of an evil philosophical idea in art, you emotionally respond in a way that, it, it, in the real world, it's hard to dissect what is, Art gives you the essence of those ideas. It gives you the immediacy of those ideas. So you experience them immediately. So, so when evil ideas like in Romeo and Juliet are manifest on stage, you're angry. Why are they, you know, to give away the ending, I don't think it's a secret, right? <laughs> Why do these beautiful people have to die? They're such a beautiful couple. They're such passionate in love. They're so amazing, right? They're breaking away from, from this evil tradition. And they have to die. I mean, the, the logic of the play necessitates, the logic of Shakespeare's philosophy necessitates that they die. And it becomes this emotional thing that this is what determinism means. So I'm mad at Sam Harris, right? It's not just an intellectual debate. This is about whether Romeo and Julia die or not, right? And that's what art gives you. It gives you that reality. Now, you can see it in history. History, you can also see 
the effects of bad ideas and what happens. But that is hard and it's, it's, it's messy and there's a lot going on. Art essentializes it. It makes it, it, it gives you the important. And this is one of the values of, 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 of experiencing philosophically evil art. That is art that projects a philosophically evil idea is to get at that concretization of what, what that means and what that is and, and what that's like. And in, in, in many respects, you gain a lot. I, I highly, highly recommend um, a, a lecture of Lena Peikoff that I don't think gets enough attention and people should listen to. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's the survival value, notice the word, survival value of great but false or evil philosophically false, philosophically evil art. Why, what value you get. Survival value as a human being. You need it to survive. A reading, tall story of, 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 of experience art that is, that, is, that is philosophically the opposite of everything we believe in. Reading Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Uh, so uh, I, I highly recommend that. I mean, it's so insightful. It was... Uh, <laughs> Just a personal note. It was a, it was a, it was a consequence. The, 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 the lecture was a consequence of a confusion paper I wrote. So of a confusion I had about aesthetics that I submitted in a class to Leonard. And, and his, his answer in the class was so amazing that he turned it into a lecture. And it was, it was, uh, it was truly, truly one of my favorite lectures. And, and for the experience of art necessary, I think, so that you don't turn away from from artists like Shakespeare, which I think you can't turn away from Shakespeare. It's, it's too important uh, it, uh, as an experience in ways that I think only Leonard, and Leonard is very good at explaining. Um, I wanted to go back to something th that we started with, which um, the, the sort of the, some of the personal value that you can get out of the Romantic Manifesto and some of its uh, kind of practical advice, and I think the basic practical advice that we'll be talking about in so, sort of more specifics, more detail tomorrow. But that's the, so, and this is going back to the issue of the, that the 19th century is the greatest century in history. It's ungraspable. And she also has a perspective. It's not in the Romantic, I mean, there's touches of it in the Romantic Manifesto and in the introduction, but she writes about this elsewhere, of what a bad cultural atmosphere does to an individual, does to a person, and does to a soul. So she has an art, one of, uh, one of my favorite articles of hers is the, uh, an article called Our Cultural Value Deprivation. And it's what it does to you if you're in a cultural environment that is devoid of values. And she's writing in the 60s where it is pretty close to devoid of values. There's elements that I think are better in the present than in the 60s. But if you're comparing it to the 19th century, and this is part in terms of thinking about the Romantic Manifesto and what she's telling you about the 19th century, you can't even fathom what it was like. And you're in a culture that is degrading your soul in various ways. And she talks about art in our cultural value deprivation, but she talks about other aspects of the culture, of its politics, um, of its in, and, or lack of intellectuality, its anti-intellectuality, indeed, and that one of the ways she puts it that I think is like it's and again this is her this kind of characterization I, I think is her as an artist giving it what's happening is a form of asphyxiation, and she gives the example of there's certain kinds like carbon monoxide poisoning that you don't even notice is happening. So you can be, I mean, so there's cases like this that someone's working on their car, they started, they don't open the garage door, and they found dead the next morning because they don't even notice that they're being um, suffocated and killed. And that, she thinks, is this is what a cultural atmosphere that is devoid of values. It's degrading your soul, and you don't even know it. And part of what she's, I mean, the essay is about is recognizing that, okay, you're, it's like you've got carbon monoxide in this. And there's things you can do about it. And the basic advice in the, for the Romantic Manifesto is there's this whole 19th century that is, much of it is buried, that you're not going to learn about, you're not going to be encouraged to experience what was there and what was possible. And this is a point she makes about capitalism. In Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal in the introduction, it's a very similar kind of thing. Capitalism is buried under a mound of silence. 
is one of the ways I think she puts it. And you're not going to learn what actually happened in the 19th century in terms of economic development, the incredible prosperity. You're going to learn about exploitation and these workers who were on strike and so on. That, yeah, that is nothing like what actually happened. And if you want to learn about what capitalism is and why it was an unknown ideal, you have to go and discover these facts. You have to go and actually explore. And in the Romantic Manifesto, it's the same point in regard to art. You actually and actively have to go out and seek this. And you need to do it because your soul is being crushed or, or suffocated. And it is that is the basic point of the Romantic Manifesto. And it's the basic point that I took from the book. I mean, I read the book at 17. And the basic thing I took from it was, okay, so she's saying that I can get aesthetic experiences, like what I get from the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged from other art. And I don't get any kind of experience currently like that. And in school, we're reading, uh, I mean, Canadian naturalistic <laughs> literature. <laughs> Um, and it is, I mean, the, the idea that this is what you would give to teenagers is, is um, I, mean, the, and, I mean, it's in a sense funny, but in a sense, this is what it means like, that you're suffocating a person's soul that is trying to reach something. And she's saying, no, there's stuff out there that is like the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrug. And my response was, okay, I'm going to try to find that stuff. And by far my favorite art form is music, so I'm going to go explore the music of the 19th century. And that's what I started doing. And it's, I mean, such a personal and profound value to me. I can't imagine my life without this thing. And that's the basic message, but that you have to actively do that. Yeah, I mean, I had the same response when reading Romantic Manifesto, though it took it a while, because in those days, it was hard to find these values. It was hard to figure them out. But yeah, just start searching. What, what do I like? Where do I find this stuff? What, what, what is... Where do I find all this art that she is talking about? And it takes work. It takes work. One of the great tragedies in the world we live in today right now is that a lot of the 19th century art, the, the paintings, the sculpture, uh, particularly the paintings and sculpture, not true of music, luckily, but painting and sculpture, is all buried. So if you go to any museum, any museum in the world, in the basement, that's where the good stuff is. It's tucked away somewhere. It's not important according to the curators of the museum. There's still good art in some of these museums, but the, a lot of the art is buried. It's, 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 it's in museums. I often see a painting in a book, and I, and I, and I want to know where it is because I'd like to go see it, and it's, oh, it's not on display. Why? Because it's in the basement, and, and, they, and they keep it there, and, and the basements are massive. There's a huge amount of art that was produced in the 19th century. It's unimaginable how much, and it's not on display, and you can't see it anywhere. Uh, but, but again, we're going to talk a lot more about that, uh, about uh, finding the art and about that uh, tomorrow. I want to talk, uh, and, and we should end soon yeah. because we go to Q&A, but, but feeding off of this, and we're going to talk about the cultural deprivation because I think, I think we don't know it, but there's carbon monoxide everywhere. If, if you think, if we live in a culture where Breaking Bad and Game of Thrones are the best, then we're, we're, in, we're in trouble. Um, but it's... <laughs> but it's uh, you know, she has an essay in, um, in the Romantic Manifesto that is just heart-wrenching, and it's, it's beautifully written, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very, it makes you really angry. It's called Art and Moral Treason, and it, it feeds off in a sense, because mm -hmm. what it does from, from the culture of deprivation is it takes one person and one example, and, and, and she gives this example of a successful businessman, somebody who's successful in life, who's been successful, but feels guilty and feels depressed and has no purpose and is, is struggling and he, and he gets rationally, he gets the ideas, but he's, he's still struggling. And when you dig deeper, he's always been attracted to certain romantic, or when he was a child, he was attracted to romantic art and that was suppressed. That was constantly, he was told, oh, life's not like that, that's not what it's like. And he, and he repressed, he repressed those emotions, that response that he had to greatness. And he, he, psychologically now, he's completely messed up. He's completely repressed. He can't connect with his emotions. He's afraid to feel. So he gets objectivism conceptually, but he can't actually get it emotionally. He can't get it. He can't live it fully. And he can't enjoy it. So he's following the virtues, but not happy. Because he's psychologically, there's a problem. And she identifies it as 
this idea that he has not been allowed, he was not allowed as a child to experience his emotions through art, through romantic art, through his heroes, whatever they were, at whatever age-appropriate level they were, right? It, it starts with cartoon heroes, it goes to superheroes maybe, and it, it goes on adventure stories, detective stories, or whatever it was. He, that was all suppressed. And the personal damage that he suffers, and the work he has to do in order to claw himself out of it, and one of the things she identifies is part of that work is to reconnect with those aesthetic experiences. Part of that work is to surround yourself with the right kind of art so you can, that, that will help you to climb out. And, 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 and one of the things we, we haven't talked about, but if you want to ask in the Q&A, is that Ayn Rand has this view of art affecting you, not just emotionally, but affecting your cognition how you do your subconscious integrations. I mean, she has this, I think I've got it here. She has this, right at the beginning of art of cognition, she has this amazing passage that is, uh, you know, that art teaches man how to use his consciousness. Art teaches man how to use his consciousness. It conditions or stylizes man's consciousness by conveying to him a certain way of looking at existence. Now, read that like 20 times and, and think about it. That's, that's deep and profound and difficult to understand. Leonard talks about that in the lecture that I, proposed, that I suggested yeah. because I think that's, it's, it's a really important. The more you surround yourself with art, in a sense, the better of a thinker you become. The right kind of art. Right? And, um, and, and, and it's th th that kind of profoundness, <laughs> if that's a word, uh, it, it, the Winding Gun is such a full of that, and it's, 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 a, it's an amazing book. Highly, highly recommend you read it many times and think about it and try to concretize it in your life. Try to bring it into your life. Try to make it real in your life. And we'll talk about this tomorrow, but it's one of the few areas where you're in complete control. You can shape your life in this realm. You want to... I mean, I can make a point? Yeah, make a last okay. point, and then we'll, we'll, um, we'll take I'll questions. make a... So, uh, Art and Moral Treason is one of my favorite articles of, in the Romantic Manifesto. Um, and it, it's written from this perspective of this person who, as, as Yaron was putting it, it, has been suffocated in various ways and, and has repressed and so on. Um, but there's many things that come in that essay about the full nature of morality. It's, it's completely, it completely transformed my view of just what the subject of morality is and how to think about it and part of what is completely wrong in the modern approach to ethic, not just that it's altruistic, and, but the Kantian utilitarian kind of, I mean, that's what you're normally presented as, these are the two major choices you have. And so They don't even really get what the subject of ethics is, um, and you can get that from art and moral treason. There's another aspect that is really important, and it's it, part about the motivational power of morality, and does it have personal power in your life? Is it a personal motivation? And that art is essential for getting that? And one perspective on this, and to link it to some of her uh, fiction, and it's what she comments on in her 25th anniversary introduction to The Fountainhead, about what The Fountainhead, uh, the sense of life that it conveys, and, and it, she puts it as man worship, and the worship is important there. And, the, the, and then she elaborates on the, what the meaning of that is, that the moral emotions are things like what you regard as sacred, <clears throat> what you revere, so the issue of reverence and worship. And that if you've never, and so this is going back to art and moral treason, if you've never experienced those emotions, you don't really get what morality is about and what its motivating power should be in your life. And art, I mean, the fountainhead, this is certainly true of, but great art, it's not, there's not that much that does this, but the experience of it to get what the actual moral emotions are and what reverence is, I don't think you can get them without art. And that's a part of it in terms of morality, part of what it can do. And this is from the, the kind of a moral philosophical perspective, this is a major, major reason you should seek out great art because it, it's, it's the only realm in which you're going to experience what those emotions are 
and in terms of trying to rebuild or build your soul, that this is what should motivate it, um, art is indispensable to that. Great. All right, well, we'll take questions, and I think the mic's over there. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. I would like to know what contemporary composers, if any, do you gentlemen enjoy? Yeah, I knew, I knew we were going to get this. What's your favorite movies? What are your favorite movies? <laughs> and I didn't bring my... Tomorrow I'm going to have my lists okay. of, uh, of my favorite movies and stuff. So if anybody's going to ask me about my favorite movies, don't ask today, yeah. ask tomorrow. Um, what, what contemporary composers do I like? I, I mean, I can't think of any. Um, I mean, there might be some in the audience who, who write music. I know there are quite a few musicians here. But uh, in terms of really your life today, writing today, I mean, I like contemporary music kind of as a background thing going on. But in terms of actually listening to music, uh, I do that. That's classical music to me. And, and I'll talk more about that tomorrow and, and what I get out of it and, and why I think it's so important. I, you know, I enjoy jazz. I, I enjoy some popular music. I grew up in the 70s. So... You know, uh, uh, I, I, I like Pink Floyd, I like uh, Bob Dylan, I like all kinds of stuff like that, but I don't love any of them, right? What I love is, I'll tell you tomorrow, in, in terms of my, 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 my favorite composers, but I, I really do think, to go to Anka's point, uh, or Ryan's point, really, I think we live in an oxygen-deprived musical and aesthetic environment in terms of what is possible, and what was, what really, what, what existed, and, and, and what is being produced and, and what we are consuming today, maybe in music more than in, in any other form, because it's, it's, so, it's, so, it's so instant gratification, it's so focused on instant gratification, and it's so focused, on, it's all the same, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's um, so, it's the best I can do for I'll, yeah, I'll say one thing. It's not a contemporary, but it's sort of the last, I think probably chronologically, the last composer that I have a major uh, love for, which is Sibelius. Um, so he's 20th century. And I, I'm bringing it up not because go and listen to Sibelius, though I think he is a great composer, but it's a point, it's relevant to part of what we were talking about in this issue of cultural value deprivation. When you look at his career and when he wrote what, a lot of it is pre-World War I or immediately after World War I. For much of his later life, he doesn't compose much. And this is, this is a thing you see with a lot of artists who span the World War I. Either after World War I, their art is dramatically different than what it was pre-World War I, or they have more and more trouble creating art. Um, as they were creating it pre-World War I. So it's very interesting to look at artists who span that. It's part of the evidence that of how much World War I was a watershed. And this idea that you're bringing values into the world, and it has to be a world worthy of those values and a world in which you want to project them. Um, that's a significant issue, and you see it even for Ayn Rand that after she writes Atlas Shrugged, she's thinking of writing other things and continuing as a fiction writer, but she can't imagine bringing her sense of life into this contemporary world. And you can see that, and you can see that. Um, I mean, she talked about that to some extent. You can see it in the journals. You can see it in the, the, the notes for the last novel that she was planning on writing and never wrote. That's a very significant issue that so it's not just what the culture does to you what it does to artists as well is a major issue in terms of thinking about art and what like why we might not have anything that that is very good in the contemporary world thank you gentlemen hi uh, sort of tangential question to the last one like you talk about 19th century romantic music as this embodiment of sense of life in music. I see that and get that totally. But do you think there are modern forms of music that have rediscovered that? Because I feel like, and you have to know where to look for them, but there are forms of rock music, and there's a lot of Rush bands in here, but that kind of rock music that seems to achieve that same thing. And it's, it's almost like that was rediscovered in the 70s and 80s. And, but if you know where to look for it, it's there. Do you think modern music can achieve that same thing? You know, it's so hard to talk about music. 
It really is. I mean, and if you read Autocognition, I mean, look at how hard it is for Ayn Rand, a genius, to talk about music. And because it's, we don't have the vocabulary. We don't quite understand what it's doing and how it's doing what it's doing. And, and she says you won't have a complete theory of music until you have physiology done and, and so on. My answer is, my answer is um, no, but I can't prove it. And I can't even really talk about it. And, this, and, and, it's, and, and I acknowledge that. And I think, I think we all need to acknowledge that, that our vocabulary... Is, I mean, some of you, again, some of you are musicians and you know more, much more about this than I do. But I, I, I think there's something about the form of, of romantic music in the late 19th century. And not to say that that was the end. And, and if, they, if World War I hadn't happened, there wouldn't have been further development. It wouldn't have got better. And maybe modern instruments being used and, and different forms. I, I just can't see it. If you look at the complexity, the length, the, 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 the form, um, the, the, the emotional power that it projects, uh, you know, late romanticism, Rachmaninoff stood piano concerto, I mean, I, I don't know what, what can, can come close to that kind of emotional experience. Now, I know people who get that from, from certain uh, uh, jazz compositions and uh, just having a, a discussion yesterday about that. And so I, I, don't wanna, I, don't wanna, I don't want to discourage you from liking what you like. And I'll talk a lot about this tomorrow. I don't want you to discourage you from liking what you like. What you like, you like. I want to encourage you to expand and broaden and experiment and try and go to places where you might have not wanted to or not, or, or where it's hard, or where you've found barriers or, or whatever. So I'm, I'm not trying to limit, I'm trying to expand, right? So, I, you know, could, could, could they have grasped something in, in the sense of life in a, in, a, in a short song or something? Yeah, but in terms of a musical aesthetic experience, I think we peaked in, in the romantic music period of the, of the late 19th century, early 20th. I mean, Rachmaninoff is, is middle, almost middle 19th century, 20th century, so it went into the 20th century. Um, but but I, I don't think you can match that. Well, thank you for a wonderful uh, discussion. Uh, in keeping with the uh, theme of music, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but in the... Uh, Art and Cognition essay. What was that? 15? 15. Rand wrote that uh, until a conceptual vocabulary is discovered and defined, no objectively valid criterion of aesthetic judgment is possible in the field of music. Um, and then it would take a joint effort of, of uh, several types of people. Um, do you, you know, since this was written you know, decades ago, do you know of Anybody who's made any advancements in that area or starting to uh, explore that field? I mean, I know of some objectivists who are looking into it, but not, I don't know if they've made advancements. Um, so if they have some theories that, that I would think of as, yeah, this is, this is adding to what Ayn, Rand, uh, Ayn Rand's hypothesis or helping to prove it or disprove it. But there may be, so I don't know about them, but there may be. But there is work being done. We, we're familiar with work being done on it um, and, and trying, to, trying to work off of that essay and expand it and in, increase our vocabulary. But I, I'm not in a position to judge whether it's right or wrong. Uh, maybe others here are, and, and, but, it, but there is work being done. It's, it's something that a lot of objectivists are interested in. Music, you know, musicians seem to be attracted to objectivism and people interested in music and musical theory. Uh, seem to be attracted to objectivism, so there's quite a, I think there's quite a bit of work being done. Yeah, I ask because I'm fascinated with the uh, idea that um, part of the difference between music and the other uh, arts is that uh, Rand states that we're still pretty much on the perceptual level and not yet on the conceptual level. And that's just kind of a fascinating insight. Well, in terms of understanding it, but the nature of music is that it's always going to be at the perceptual level. So, and she makes this point. I think Tal put up a slide where she makes that point. Music is different than other arts because music's, music is immediately impactful on our emotions. It doesn't go through any kind of analysis or, or thought. It just impacts directly, immediately. So it's, 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 in that sense, it's always going to be at the perceptual level in terms of experiencing it. But we don't have the tools yet to completely understand that process. That's what she's talking about. Thank you. It's, it's part of what makes literature 
distinctive and I think partly why it's easier to analyze that literature, I mean, so the other visual arts start at perception as well. Literature starts with concepts and is using concepts to build percepts, um, so to build a perceptual world that you can visualize and imagine in your mind. I mean, that's what the Fountainhead does say, but it starts with concepts, it starts with an abstract devices, and that's different than the other art music, but also the visual arts that all start with perception. Uh, what is the purpose of corporate art, in particular the kind of odd sculptures you see in front of buildings? Uh, what are they trying to achieve and do they achieve it? I saw, I saw one right around the corner from the hotel here that I couldn't understand. Well, I mean, if you read the Ayn Rand, first of all, Ayn Rand has a, a pretty clear view of, of so-called modern art. She doesn't think it's art. She thinks it's at best decorative, often um, ugly and disruptive. Uh, but it, 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 I, I don't know what particular thing you saw, but if it's some metal thing, then it's not art. It's just... Yeah, basically. Now, what is the purpose of it? The purpose is a good purpose. Uh, the, the, ideally, not... I don't know what their purpose is, but the purpose of, of having art outdoors like that is to create an aesthetic environment for your workers, to create a pleasant place to work and a pleasant place to be, so that... And, and it projects a certain image of what the corporation is about. I would recommend right across the street from the hotel, I don't know which direction that is, there's some public building, it looks like some building, library maybe, a and there's house. a sculpture of Je Jefferson and Hamilton. Yeah, it's a courthouse. It's a courthouse. Yeah. Uh, Hamilton and Jefferson right there, really good sculptures, they, they're a little faded because they're old and, and a little uh, uh, dirty, but, but you know. But the point of sculptures like that is to, is to convey something about this environment that we're creating, this building, this square, this whatever so that it's beautiful, so that it's inspiring, so that it's, it's pleasant to, to, to walk through and, and to, to live in. And I think that's the good purpose of corporate art. I think today it's not art, it's ugly, it's silly, uh, and, and uh, I wish they'd spend their money elsewhere. Hi, thanks. Um, I was wondering if you see a connection between love and art. So <laughs> if, yeah, nice easy one. Um, <laughs> So if you think about, uh, Rand has a statement, and, and I'm, I'm going to butcher it, but she says, show me, you know, um, show me a picture of a woman that a man loves, and I can tell you, you know, all about him, essentially. And I find you could do the same thing almost with art. Um, so to me, there seems to be some kind of, you know, um, existential uh, um, connection. So wondering your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, it's a connection that she brings up, and she brings up in the Romantic Manifesto. Um, I would caution a few things. So one, the statement in Atlas Shrugged about tell me what, I think it's something like tell me what a man finds sexually attractive and I can tell you his philosophy of life. Maybe Ayn Rand can do that. <laughs> um, the idea Don't that, try yeah, it at home. <laughs> yeah. The, <clears throat> so there's a difference between, so the, the phenomenon that she's bringing up in the Romantic Manifesto is that and so again, this pr dual perspective from the, pr the creator of art and then the response to art, it comes from a phenomenon that she calls a sense of life. And we'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow. That whole issue is a complex issue. And she thinks that in um, love and particularly romantic love, the same phenomenon is it, at work. So both for the person you love, what their sense of life is, and your sense of life that is, so that interaction is, is, so she thinks there's a deep commonality between these. But the, now on the art side, what is important, I think, is to say that art and a work of art conveys sense of life is not to say that it conveys in a way that would be graspable to the viewer, the full sense of life of the artist. And Ayn Rand makes a point about her own sense of life, that you, uh, that's uh, us, and, and I mean the audience that she was talking to, have no clue about my sense of life. And then she says, well, you have an easier way of knowing something about mine than I do of knowing about yours, because mine is on every page of my novels. But I hesitate to think how little 
of it is. That, and so what you could grasp. So that sense of life is involved and it doesn't mean you can look at a work of art and tell this is the whole sense of life. It's the sense of life embodied in that work of art that you're interested in. Whereas in a romantic relationship, it is, it's the, you're interested in the person's full sense of life, which takes long to get to sort of think I've got a handle on that and she has comments about that too of how she said something like after many years you may know approximately the sense of life of the uh, person the individual you're in love with but it, so it's very important to understanding and what she thinks the phenomenon is but be cautious about okay I can now list this, this person's sense of life it's x y and, and be very cautious also of, of these what I would just, they're sort of like labels that, that you think you understand and you don't. Oh, he's got a malevolent sense of life, or he's got a tragic sense. You don't really know what you're talking about if that's how you're, that, that's, it's, it's the, and it often all it means is it's something I don't like about his sense of life, so it's malevolent. Right. Um, and that's not real categorization. Yeah, thank you, it's interesting. Hi, um, maybe a bit closer. Um, I want to ask about the relationship between art and education. Um, familiar and uh, understand the, the position that, uh, to, to, that art can on the si um, have a supplementary use for education, for, uh, for didactic uh, purposes, and uh, Conceivably, some uh, some work, didactic uh, works can have some aesthetic uh, value, but uh, but uh, what I mean is they are similar in their structure. They're both select, very selective. They are both um, oriented towards uh, helping the human mind uh, grasp a certain um, idea, and oftentimes there be, uh, the purpose between art and education is confused or mixed, like for example, when uh, certain authors are actually trying to build art to quote, educate the masses. So uh, what I wanted to ask is um, where I could, uh, if, if you are familiar with anybody uh, basically placing these two fields and purposes side by side and clearing, uh, clarifying what their differences and similarities are. I mean, if I understand the question, I'm not sure I do, but I, I think a big part of it is what is the goal? Art's goal is not to educate. It can be used to educate, but the goal is not to educate. The purpose of art is to experience. It's the experience as an end in itself. It's what you get from that moment of interaction with the art or the many moments of interaction with the art, what you're getting from it. That is the purpose of art. Any educational purpose is, is a secondary or third level uh, consideration. Education is concerned primarily with the education, that it has a purpose. Uh, it, it's not about the experience. So they're two different phenomena, and you think about them completely differently. And if you read the Romantic Manifesto, I mean, she, education doesn't really come up much other than kind of a, in a sense, a moral education, you know, by, by creating this model that you can emulate, that you can live by. One but, aspect where they seem to overlap, though it's kind of secondary to both fields, is uh, one um, purpose, though not perhaps the primary of art, is to help a person grasp uh, a complex abstract idea. And uh, of basically to retain it, to be able to use So it. we're really well, short on time, oh, so I'm going to let Anka answer and try to get one more question yeah. in. It, it, it's to retain and give its full meaning. So it, art is cognitive in that sense, and one of our art in cognition, but it's education is breaking up, and these are the principles. The, the point that it's for experience, that's the really, really, really important point. And she gives an analogy, that, which is, and you can think of this in terms of education. An airplane is for flying. It's for that experience. Yes, you can take an airplane apart and you might have a class where you're taking an airplane apart and this is how it's put together and this is what enables it to fly and if you change the wing like this, it's going to crash. 
That's education, and you can analyze the airplane from that, but it's, it's a radically different experience and activity. So there can be connections between them, but you have to get that their purposes are radically different. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, this will be the last question, I think. Yep. Um, there is a theme in popular, in a lot of popular artworks that I think is very emotionally appealing to Americans. And I'd be interested to hear your comments on what you think the philosophical um, influences would be that would give rise to the theme. Three examples I would give for this is American Beauty, the, the movie, um, Sopranos, and Breaking Bad, where you have kind of dual sides of the nature of the characters of good and evil. And over time, it's kind of revealed that the good side, the light side, is a fake veneer, and the characters descend into destruction as the real, true side of them, the evil side, emerges. Um, so I, I'd be interested to hear why you think that appeals to the public and maybe what, what philosophical influence would give rise to that. I've only seen American Beauty, which I hated. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, was going to say Catcher in the Rye, too, I might mean, there be are, an there example. I mean, a lot of these, and, and you're right. It's, it's a common theme. It's, it's, uh, it's a, you know, if you take Breaking Bad, it's, it's this idea of a supposedly good person. Every good person has a monster hidden inside of him. And, and what, what brings out the monster is small, moral, uh, breaks and it's a slippery slope and then the, the monster emerges and he's, he's a real monster and it's, it's, it's all done. Where does that come from? That comes from uh, the logic thing, contemporary philosophy, the, 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 the idea that, that man is flawed, that man is fallen, that man, you know, we're all really uh, deep down if you just let loose, if you, if you, if you take away the, the constraints of conventional society, we're just, uh, you know, savages in the woods and, and we do anything to anybody. Uh, so it comes from a rich philosophical, um, uh, you know, tradition uh, of, of the last 200 years that portrays man as basically depraved and that we put on a civilized facade in our day-to-day -day lives, present ourselves as good, but really, if you give us the opportunity, we would just wreak havoc on the world and we would rape and pillage. And, and people believe this and, and it's manifest in art over and over and over again. I, I, part of the you know, part of the appeal of Game of Thrones is, hey, we get to vicariously rape and pillage on a large scale every week on every show. And it's, it's, but it, it's tragic and it's horrible that this is the best. And it is aesthetically some of the best, hmm. uh, you know, television or whatever that's being created. But those are the themes. And those are the experiences that we get. And, and I can't remember American Beauty. I saw it a long time ago. I remember hating it. But I can't remember it enough to say anything about it but, it, but I think it's the same thing. Why are we attracted to the Sopranos? We're attracted to the Sopranos because, because here's a guy who's kind of nice in his family. He's a gangster from the beginning to the end. He's a bad guy. He slaughters people left and right. And vicariously, we're living this idea of you can kill people. You can, that, that's, what, that's what it's about. And he has this facade of civilized. He lives in a nice house. He has normal children, semi-normal children. And he has a wife. And it's, it's as if you can have... But that comes out of directly out of, I think, the philosophy and the culture in which we live. Okay, I believe we're out of time. I got the one minute. Thank you all. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.